I'm AJ Bianco, host of Reflect Ed, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Earlier this year, I stepped away from hosting this podcast because I knew before the school year started that I would need to put even more of myself into being the best teacher I could be. I knew there would be challenges, both in the high school and at the college level, to teach fully online and be as effective or more effective for my students. In the last three months, I've experienced success and failure with my students. Today, I want to share what I've learned about engaging students virtually with you, and hopefully, we'll continue to grow and excel even through these uncertain times. Strike up the band. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Chris Nessie. The House of Ed Tech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. I discuss technology that is changing our classrooms and schools, and I share tools and tips that you can hear today and use tomorrow. You're going to hear the stories of teachers, leaders, and creators just like you. The purpose? Whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way you teach and how your students learn. Guess who's back? Back again. Chris is back. Tell a friend what is up, everybody. I'm back for this episode. Derek Larson is going to be back in episode 169, and then we'll be back together for episode 170, the 2020 House of Ed Tech Smackdown. I am just really excited to be doing this episode. If you were not aware, I've been editing the episodes behind the scenes, and Derek has done a fantastic job filling in for me for the last bunch of episodes. And uh, I am forever grateful to Derek for volunteering and stepping up and creating the content that he's been creating. And he's got one more solo act coming up in episode 169. So I look forward to bringing you that episode. Now, if you're new to the show, you might be thinking, wait, I've been listening to the show for a few episodes. This is not the voice I'm used to hearing. Well, hi, my name is Chris Nessie. I'm the host of this podcast and uh, I'm back and I'm looking forward to changing things up as we get into 2021. A lot of things going on here at the House of Ed Tech. I'm really, really excited. And as I sat down to plan this episode, I was putting my notes, you know, using workflowy.com to create my outline and my bullet points and, you know, collect my thoughts. And there's a lot on this page. And I realized I don't need to recap the last three months in the next 45 minutes to an hour. That's what 2021 is for. That's what each and every episode of this podcast is for. What I am looking forward to is reconnecting with you and being back behind the microphone. So we're getting closer to that. Again, I'll be back behind the mic full time, starting with episode 170. And uh, we're going to have a great time going forward. In this episode, we've got all the usual parts and pieces that make up a great episode here of this podcast. I've got an EdTech thought, and I'm going to be sharing with you the audio from a recent Pass the Scope EDU that I participated in, which the hashtag was for November, hashtag rest up, teach up. So I participated in that via Periscope, and I'm going to share that here because I think the message is important here during these very interesting times in education. My EdTech recommendation, I am really excited about this. I am going to share with you a great virtual whiteboard app that I probably wrote down, gosh, maybe a month, month and a half ago, and I've just been sitting on it, wanting to share it and talk about it. And I think this app, this app, this app, (laughs) I think this app is better than Jamboard. That's right. I think what I'm about to share with you is going to blow your minds. And if you're a Jamboard fan, 
be open-minded for what I'm going to share with you for this episode's EdTech recommendation. I've got a great House of EdTech VIP, and the featured content in this episode, I'm going to be sharing the audio from a PD session I recently gave to colleagues in my school district about engaging students virtually. So I love it when I can present for my colleagues. I love it when I can create this content for you. So why not mash them up? It was a really great PD session, and I'm looking forward to sharing that with you because, you know, engaging students now virtually, hybrid, remote, I mean, I I debated on like what I should title this. What would be the perfect title for this episode? Obviously, I, I landed on strategies for engaging students in virtual learning, but that can be virtual, that can be hybrid, that can be remote. And some of these strategies can be used when you are in the classroom with your students, if they're there six feet apart, or if you're listening to this many years down the road, you know, who knows what it looks like. (laughs) I'm talking to you and it's uh, near the end of 2020. I'm not going to try to predict the future, but I do want you to know that I have missed talking to you. I really have. And that the time away has allowed me to be reflective, get creative, focus on, you know, my teaching, whether it's high school or college and I just, you know, I got a little sappy when I sort of said goodbye a few months ago, and I'm kind of sappy here coming back. I'm just, I really appreciate the fact that you make House of Ed Tech and listen to me and make me a part of your anytime, anywhere professional development. So I just want to say thank you. And, you know, it, I, I should say it every episode, and I don't, but just know that I appreciate the fact that you listen. And if you're a new listener, Just know, I really appreciate the fact that you are taking the time to listen to this podcast. I I make this for me. I make this for you. So there you go. Um, Just a couple of updates. Uh, The creative juices were flowing in the time that I've been away from House of Ed Tech, and I've started a new podcast. I started a new podcast with AJ Bianco. It has nothing to do with education. So that's a nice break for both of our brains because... I've got House of Ed Tech and Podcast PD. AJ's got Podcast PD and his Reflect Ed podcast. So we decided let's do something that has nothing to do with education. And if you're a Yankee baseball fan or if you enjoy baseball, we have started a podcast called The Chase for 28, which you can find at chasefor28.com. And it's me and AJ talking baseball, talking Yankee baseball. And we're just really excited to just have some fun turning on our microphones, using the tech, the tools, and talking baseball. So if you enjoy baseball, and if you enjoy Yangi baseball, we'd love it if you would check us out. That'd be really cool. As I mentioned also here at the beginning of the show, episode 170 is the 2020 Smackdown, and you need to get your submissions to me by December 1st, 2020. And that is coming up close as uh, if you're listening to this the day it comes out, it's November 22nd. So Get me your audio. Get me your DMs on Twitter, DMs on Instagram. Again, I prefer audio because this is an audio podcast. So record your audio, speak pipe it to me, call the hotline. Very simply, go to chrisnessy.com slash feedback. So that way you can uh, send me your ed tech tool, tip, recommendation. What have you loved in ed tech here in 2020? And that's what episode 170 is all about. It's the last episode of the calendar year. If you are Again, a new listener, go back and listen to a couple of the last episodes of the year from the previous six years, and you get an idea of what I want to do. It's my voice a lot, but I want to get you involved in the show too, and that's part of the plan for 2021. More conversations, more me, more you, more House of Ed Tech. So that's the plan. Let's get into the content here, and I think I'm going to look at my outline And let's go over to my EdTech thought, where again, I'm going to share with you my recent Pass the Scope EDU broadcast, where again, the hashtag was rest up, teach up. And we are here for another round of Pass the Scope EDU. The hashtag is rest up, teach up. Last night, I'm just going to tell a story. Last night, 
I went to bed at like 9.15. Normally, I am up like maybe you are most nights till maybe 10, 10.30, 11, 11, 30, 12, 1, 2. We got to stop burning the candle, my friends. We got to take care of ourselves. We need to rest. I probably shouldn't be doing this Periscope right now at 10.30 at night, but here I am because it's important that you hear that it's okay to rest. How can we do our best work as teachers if we're tired? And it's not easy right now. We're all doing the best we can, but self-care, we need to do that for ourselves because we are taking the time to show empathy and grace and compassion for our students in many places, in many schools. That's not being afforded to us as teachers. In some places, you're still expected to perform as if nothing is happening in the world right now. And we can complain that it's not fair all we want. But when it comes down to it, one, there's nothing we can do except to take care of ourselves. We need to have boundaries to create time to rest. It's so important. You know, just a couple of years ago, and many people who know me like Stacy, like AJ, they know Chris was burning the candle at both ends, up at 5 a.m. every day in the car by 6, up late editing podcasts up till midnight, 12.30, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock on like a Wednesday. And that's just not healthy. I don't think there's a profession out there that's worth me or anybody else being up so late. There is nothing so important that we would physically hurt ourselves and risk our health by not sleeping, not resting, not taking time for ourselves. Where I'm sitting right now, I spend way more time here during the day than I'd like. Now, granted, I love the computer. I love the microphone. I love creating the content I do. I love editing podcasts, but that's my choice. Now, I chose to be a teacher. I chose to be an educator. And here, you know, here, here we are each day, you know, up at 6 a.m. shower breakfast with my kids who are also, you know, virtual and remote right now. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to be completely virtual at the high school I work at in the district that I work in here in New Jersey by 750 here at the computer. Google meets are open. The school day starts at eight o'clock. Teach your 80 minute classes. Have your lunch and your prep. Feed my own kids. I'm thankful that, you know, here where I am, you know, my classroom, if I get tired and I, you know, all I can do is like this, I can, I can lean back in my chair and, you know, I can maybe close my eyes in my classroom if I feel tired, but here at home, I got, I got this extra bed. I mean, the, the, you know, the house of ed tech is a spare room in my house. So I can, I can crash on the guest bed. Some nights that's, that's where I sleep. I don't want to disturb my wife, you know, and I'll just crash there and then I'll get up and I just basically get out of bed and come to school and sit here. You got to rest. You've got to rest. You've got to put boundaries in place. Yes, I care about my students. Yes, you care about your students, but we tell them not to stay up late, not to play video games, get a good night's rest. But then what do so many of us do? We're up again right now, 1030 at night. Last night I was already asleep for an hour. I don't know. I guess, you know, to, to, to wrap things up, my message is self-care and rest are important. Get a good night's sleep, get seven to eight hours, you know, don't sit on your phone in bed. You know, basically everything I would tell my students not to do, we shouldn't be doing, but now granted, I'm going to hang up on this call. I'm going to go have a snack. I'm going to get into bed and I'm going to scroll through my phone. I'm going to check out TikTok. I'm going to catch up on Instagram. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Just maybe take a little time to give yourself the space and the time you need. Because if you want to do your best in your real classroom or your virtual classroom, you need to, you need to have your wits about you. And that starts with taking care of yourself. You take care of yourself. I'm going to take care of myself. Thank you to my friends at Pass the Scope EDU for this opportunity. And uh, hopefully I'll be a part of December's. Be on the lookout for that. 
Check out hashtag past the scope edu for information related to this great monthly event and how you can be a part of it. You take care of yourself. I'm going to do something to go take care of myself. I'm going to, again, have a snack, get some rest. I'll be back at it tomorrow and I'll be much better off for it because I will get a good night's rest. So you don't stay up too late, get your rest, and I'll see you next month. Take care. Hope you enjoyed that EdTech thought. If you're not a part of Pass the Scope EDU, there's a lot of 15-minute increments in the day, so make sure you go to the link in the show notes out of chrisnessy.com slash 168 so you can get connected with the Pass the Scope EDU community. I'm there. You should be there too because there's a great opportunity for you to share your voice and your point of view on these monthly topics. So I hope to see you there. Okay, let's do the recommendation. And like I said at the top of the show, what I'm about to share is, I think, way better than Google Jamboard. And what I want to talk about today is whiteboard.chat. That's right, whiteboard.chat. It's free to use. You can connect up to 100 people to these virtual whiteboard spaces that you can create. But as I say that, I'm kind of getting a little ahead of myself. So what does this let you do? It is a virtual whiteboard space where you can draw, share, and collaborate. You can connect multiple people and multiple devices to the same board. You can draw with your finger. You can draw with a mouse. You can draw with a pencil. Not a real pencil, but like the Apple Pencil or some type of stylus on an iPad or some other tablet or a touchscreen Chromebook. Whatever device you've got, you're accessing the internet, you can get to whiteboard.chat. And again, it's free to use. This is so freaking cool. So I can create two kinds of spaces on whiteboard.chat. I can create one virtual whiteboard space with, as I tested it, what appears to be unlimited pages. So Google Jamboard, you're limited to 20 of their slide things. With whiteboard.chat, you can keep adding pages to the virtual whiteboard space. So if you've got 25 kids in a class, you could create one whiteboard space with 25 pages where you can assign each kid a page in this whiteboard space. Or you can give each user their own virtual whiteboard space and you can monitor what they're doing. So you can observe, you can mentor, you can coach them while they're doing stuff. The cool thing is there are a lot of free backgrounds like grid paper, lined paper, so you can have kids doing annotations or drawing or anything you would do on a whiteboard, you can do in this. You can upload PDF files and have kids write and annotate text or, I, I it pains me to say it, you can take your uh, physical worksheet, scan it and upload it to this and they could write on the on a worksheet, okay? It's possible. You could upload images and have them annotate. You can upload scanned documents and have them highlight, you know? So there are a lot of things that you can do. And what I like about it, it's free, it's easy, it's web-based. And again, it works on multiple devices. You can be on your laptop, a kid could be on their phone, a kid could be on a tablet, all right? Again, you can connect up to 100 people to a board. You can export your boards when you're done as PDFs. And again, multiple devices. And you can also easily observe and coach multiple individual users. Is it worth checking out? I think so, especially if you're a fan of Jamboard, you might really like this. Or let's be honest, you might hate it and say, Chris, what are you thinking? This does not compare to Jamboard. Well, if you don't think I'm right, let me know. Tag me on Twitter. Send me some feedback. Let me know your thoughts. If you have another interactive virtual whiteboard tool like this, and I know that there are others out there, but this is one that I've really taken a liking to, let me know. Reach out. Chris Nessie dot com slash feedback. And we can certainly have that conversation. I would love to know what you think and make sure you go check out whiteboard dot chat. It's good to be back. And that's my house of ed tech recommendation. Okay. Time for the featured content. 
and I'm very excited to share the audio from a presentation that I recently did for my district for teachers grades K through 12. So I had elementary school teachers, I had middle school teachers, I had some of my colleagues that I work with in this session that was all about how to engage students virtually. And I share, I think, 20, 25 different strategies that are based on my experience, based on some research I've done in trying to do better at this thing called teaching over the last three months. So I'm really excited that I got to do this session. And I'll be honest, I'm really excited to share it with you. So sit back, relax, mow the lawn, shovel the driveway. Who knows when you're listening to this, but let's, uh, let's dig into some strategies as, uh, I play this audio for you. So let's do this. What is going on, Zebra Nation? It is 3.30 in the afternoon. It is time for some hopefully relevant, hopefully exciting, and maybe a little bit entertaining professional development. My name is Chris Nessie. I work at New Brunswick High School, social studies department. I see another social studies teacher out in the audience. What is up, Miss Moody? How you doing today? I see other faces and avatars from the high school, so it's so nice to see people that I haven't seen in like years, which, let's be honest sucks. So I'm happy to be here. Prevent, prevent, pre- I'm going to prevent professional development today that it's been a long day. <laughs> uh, so I hope everybody is having a, as good as you can rainy day here or, or wherever you are. I hope to facilitate some stimulating conversation and we can all grow over the next 60 minutes. So very exciting. Hopefully you're in the right place. You signed up for engaging students during whatever this is that we call education right now. Uh, This is being recorded. I don't know what I'm going to do with the recording, but as you could tell by my setup, you never know what I'm going to do with a recording of audio and video. Yeah, this is, this is on the fly. This is the joy of live and it's intimidating seeing Ms. Sheridan just stare you down. (laughs) (laughs) I know you're watching you too. (laughs) All right. So we have what could be a potential very full house today larger than most classes, but still a lot of people. But see, the funny thing is this doesn't look too different from my class because it's me and a lot of avatars. Although I will say all of your avatars are appropriate. I don't know if you do that at the younger <laughs> version, but it's, it's nice not to see a lot of SpongeBob's. And this is typically how I start my own classes. You know, I, I fire up my Google Meet. I have music playing into the Google Meet from Spotify. Typically, it's music I like because anything they like is not safe for my own ears. <laughs> but I'm getting there. We're, we're building a rapport. We're, maybe I'll start taking requests. But what you would also have noticed is when you got into this Google Meet, I've got a, a slide up and ready and going. And I use a, this template every day where I've got my objectives up any announcements, things that I'm doing. And uh, because you're adults, I didn't call it a do now. I just said, you know, while you're waiting, here's something <laughs> to think about and, and share in the, uh, in the chat. And typically my do now, I, I simply go out and I Google random questions to ask people. And I just choose literally random questions every day, even as a social studies teacher, just to get them talking. And it works. I, I've asked my students, ninth graders, some 10th graders, some, some older, just some really interesting questions that usually have nothing to do with history, but it gets them talking. And right off the bat, you know, they they, they participate in the chat and over time here through the first three months of school now or so has gotten them to sometimes unmute their microphones. Uh, we've gotten past accidentally turning on your camera. Some of them turn on their camera on purpose and, you know, you don't see anything that you don't want to see. So, you know, we're getting there. And I know this is all going towards February when I get a whole new group of students and I have to start all over again with kids who don't know me and I don't know. Certainly what I'm trying here in the fall is all one big experiment and you are all doing your own experiment. You are doing the same thing that I'm doing. Whatever grade you teach, you are trying to engage your students and teach them and build relationships with them and get to know them 
and make it a positive experience, not only for them, but it needs to also be a positive experience for us. And I'll be honest, over the last three months, I have struggled many days where it's downright depressing to sometimes go a whole day or multiple days and not hear a student's voice, not see a student's face. Now, I'm lucky, at least here in the first half of the year, I've got an in-class support teacher. So I do have for two classes, one other adult-like person. I'm sorry, she is an adult (laughs) who I do get to talk to and interact with. And that has helped. I'm not so much looking forward to the spring when I'm going to be by myself starting from scratch. But like everyone in every situation, I'm going to make the best of it. So what are we going to do today? I want to facilitate a discussion around best practices and not just what I'm doing in my classroom, but I want to give you all the opportunity to share what's working in your classroom. Because even though I teach high school, there might be something you're doing as an elementary school teacher or a middle school teacher that might work at the high school level and vice versa. Things that some of us high school teachers are doing might work to engage your students as well. And while I do have a presentation prepared with with some points to go over, by no means do I want you to consider this to be you sitting there listening to me talk for an hour. At any time, unmute your microphone, jump in, share something, ask a question in the chat. Basically, everything that doesn't happen during the day for most of us, feel free to just do the opposite of that. Jump in. And we we could certainly make it a conversation Um, because I'm not the expert. I'm not the smartest person on this Google meet. None of us by ourselves are, but together what we do in the next hour could change what we do as teachers and ultimately have a great impact on all of our students. So, all right. So I have a very short presentation of 25 tips that I have scoured the internet for and having conversations and just kind of putting together my own thoughts on, you know, remote learning and, and, and what this looks like. Um, also, just so everybody knows, at the end, I will share a link to the feedback survey. And I will say this now, if you enjoy yourself and you get a lot of value, remember, my name is Chris Nessie. If you are miserable for the next hour and you get nothing out of it, put in somebody else's name. Thank you in advance. Engaging students, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, it should start with the students. We need to consider their lives, their day, and their well-being. That, that's the most important thing. They, they, I mean, some of us who have children, we know that our own children can become the center of the universe, the sunshine in the sky, the second incarnate of Jesus Christ walking down the street or riding their bicycle. We need to put our students first. We know that within our community, there are certain challenges that exist, and we can't forget that. We need to be the teacher that we ourselves would have needed if this happened while we were in school, except for the fact that what would education have looked like if this happened in the 80s or the 90s or, you know, 10 years ago, what would this have looked like? So we need to give special consideration. And, you know, if you're up on stuff, you know, you're reading things about, you know, give students grace and, you know, be understanding and show empathy. And, I'm not here to dispute any of that. We have to do that. So that's why I have number one being it starts with students. We need to check in with our students and we need to really check in. You know, it's not just about writing, at least at the high school level, it's not about putting notes in about this kid didn't show up virtually, this kid left early. You know, can we make the positive phone calls home? Can we send our students positive emails? Or if you're at the younger levels, if you're using, you know, Class Dojo or some other communication tool with your students, you know, please send the messages, let the parents know when they're doing wonderful things, you know, and that goes a long way, especially for students who maybe they teeter on the edge of, you know, misbehaving or not doing the right thing academically, pumping them up and lifting them up with, with a compliment and, you know, a positive message can certainly go a long way and make a really good impression on their experience during this time. Number two, simplify it. I was going to put that we should kiss it and like keep it simple, stupid, but you know, we're we're professionals, but let's keep things simple. Simplify what you teach, how you teach it, and how students will show what they've learned. 
I made this mistake in the spring where I tried to translate what I would be doing in the classroom to try and make it just a virtual replica of that. And that didn't work on so many levels. One didn't have high attendance Two, it just didn't work, but it was mostly because of the attendance where if I don't have students to work with, none of nothing I want to do is going to translate. Now, having had the summer to prepare and go into this, the, obviously, you know, being a history teacher, the, the, what I teach doesn't change. Okay. That's why we have curriculum, but how I teach it and how I'm leveraging Google meets had to adapt, you know, until I got that breakout feature, I had to eliminate all of the group work. And that was a choice that I made. Maybe you found ways to make group work happen in September and October, and that worked. And that's fantastic. I had to look at my students and make the best decision I could. So I had to change what I was doing. And that's the real message for this. Sometimes you can't do what you've always done and expect the same results, especially with these variables of Google Meets. I mean, my biggest frustration on a daily basis is, and, and I'm waiting for it, to, for it to happen in this Google Meet is I'm going to click on something that, you know, maybe I, I want to stop sharing my screen or I interact with this and it's going to kick me off the Google Meet. And then I got a lot, and then I got to click back in. And I don't know why that happens. I mean, I love Google. If, if, if Google was a woman, I would cheat on my wife with Google. That's how much I love Google. <laughs> but sometimes Google does me dirty and that can be frustrating. So we, we can all relate to that, you know, <laughs> but keep it simple. Um, we should be prioritizing skills and concepts um, because that, that's what, what's going to last at any level the skills. All right. Even as a high school history teacher, uh, for me, yes, the history is there. History has a place, but I'm not expecting any of my students to grow up and become historians based on their experience in the ninth grade. I might get one or two, but that's not their life ambition to go and study history like I did. So in my class, I find ways and I focus on creating, collaborating, communicating, and critical thinking. History and the content of, for me, world history is just the vehicle we use to teach those four things. So everything we do revolves around them getting better at being better communicators, creators, collaborators, and critical thinkers. And doing this here in Google Meets and having them do these breakout groups, now it's really amplifying their opportunity to experience these things. The world that we're living in and they're going into is going to be way more virtual than it ever was. I think that's safe to say. So, but keep it simple. Number three, work backward from the context of remote teaching. Synchronous live teaching to an online group of children is, as we now know, very different than doing it in person in a classroom. I long for the days of being in my classroom. And typically I only say that in August. Now I've been saying that since like July, like I, I want to get back in my classroom. I, I would love to be around my kids. And it's just strange to know that I've got you know, a hundred something kids that for many of them, I have no idea what they look like. I have no idea what they sound like. Um, I've been doing public address announcing for the football team. So I've gotten to go to the stadium and see former students, but I had a student come to the game and I promoted that Like I'll be making a live appearance. And this kid came up to the press box and he's like, are you Mr. Nessie? I said, yes. He goes, Oh, I'm so-and-so I said, Oh, it's, you know, it's nice to meet you. We, we elbowed, we fist bumped. Um, and he's like, Mr. Nessie, I just have to be honest with you. I thought you'd be taller. <laughs> because, you know, I, I'm a, I'm about five eleven and a half, six foot. If you know, I'm going to argue. Um, but typically, this is what they see. I'm sitting down in a chair, and they have no idea, other than this, what I look like. So, you know, that that that's the situation we're in. But uh, to get back to this point, uh, when we work backwards, okay, um, we are thinking small. We are creating bite sized chunks within the learning activities that we are designing. We are being very clear with our objectives. We're being very intentional about how we transition. Uh, I, I give elementary school teachers so much credit. If I was an elementary school teacher, I would have to teach phys ed because I, I would want to just play. And I, I don't know that I could teach and how an elementary school teacher effectively transitions from one subject to the next is amazing. I remember my experience and it was the train schedule. You know, we did this from this time to this time, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. I don't know how well that works or what that, what that even looks like in the virtual environment. 
from my own perspective as a parent, I see my son who's in kindergarten learning over to my right each and every day. And for those who are old enough, it kind of looks like romper room, the way his teacher interacts with him in a Google meet and keeps him engaged. It's like he's watching a TV show on Disney junior. So it's just very intentional and everything is bite-sized and everything is so chunked and very intentional. Uh, And I've seen that for elementary kindergarten and my older son, who's in third grade. And I try to even bring that idea into my Google meets where we have our do now we take breaks. I send them off. I I use the breakout room. So it's not just me yapping at them for 80 minutes. Sometimes we finish early and I let them go. Okay. We finish what we need to do. There's five minutes. Go have an extra few minutes. Look away from the screen. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So we got, we got to chunk this stuff. Number four, consider meeting for briefer periods of time more frequently. Now, again, at the, at the secondary level, we have our schedule. We have to do what we have to do. So this is more for the elementary school teacher who, how, how do you break up your day? You know, are you building in breaks? You know, what does that look like? I can't really speak to that other than I thought of it and seeing what my own children do. So if you're not chunking and you're having your students at the elementary level, just sit there and sit there and sit there and try to hold their attention the same way you would in the classroom. If you're doing that, I'm sure you've been frustrated. So maybe consider building in breaks and shortening and giving them the opportunity to step away from the device, you know, explore their house and make the curriculum and the content more authentic. Number five, be the lead learner as much as you are the quote unquote teacher. To put it another way, model caring for your students, model caring about learning And the role it plays in their well-being and growth, even for yourself. I think now is a great time to be even more of a storyteller. Show them what it means to be truly curious and active in this virtual environment. I've made the phrase, I don't know, a big part of who I am as not only a person, but also as a teacher. I don't have all the answers. Okay, I'm just like a few steps ahead of them on the journey. So in showing them that I am curious and willing to learn, I hope that that kind of rubs off on them and they will develop their own sense of what it means to wonder and be curious. So demonstrate that you are also willing to learn, not just one who has all the answers because the reality is we don't have all the answers. Uh, Number six, use lighting and sound. You know, to some degree, this is a performance, right? You you come in, I got music playing. I mean, I I can do little sound effects and there are little, there, there are websites that you can find That'll play soundboards for Zoom meetings that you can use in a Google Hangout. Um, So, I mean, if anybody was to dispute me, I mean, you could dispute me. Wrong, sir. Wrong. Shut up, Wonka. (laughs) (laughs) So make it engaging. Make it entertaining. I mean, sometimes I will start class like I, I, I do the music, the countdown. And sometimes I'll start with something like this. Where are my minions at? And then, you know, other times, it's kind of like this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Anyone seen this before? Yeah, that's a good one. I know. <laughs> so it's got to be entertaining. So, you know, between lights and sound, I mean, if you have a fog machine, I mean, entertain them. I mean, on Halloween, I did most of my classes with an Iron Man mask on. So have props. You, if you're not having fun, how are they supposed to enjoy the experience as well? So, so that's my big takeaway. You need to have fun. You got into this partly because you thought teaching would be fun. There's no reason why this virtual experience can't be enjoyable for us too. So have fun. Number seven, games. Obviously, again, music. Um, take breaks. Again, we, we can use things like Kahoot. Uh, you can encourage them to actually play games using, again, the, the dreaded coolmathgames.com might have a relevancy in our virtual classes now where it can be even more used as a reward. You know, you, you might have students that are of age that, you know, maybe they're playing Among Us. Well, maybe there's a way you could all play Among Us together and and have that shared gaming experience. Or you're bringing things like Kahoot or you're playing games through Nearpod or Paradeck. 
or just other ways you can share your screen. Maybe you're bringing in a jam board and playing hangman or tic-tac-toe or jeopardy or wheel of fortune, you know, just build in fun, maybe even more so than you would normally do. Number eight, use different tools for different things than you usually do. So while many video streaming platforms and learning management systems have a large amount of tools to consider, start with what you know and what you know works and then go from there. Maybe it's sending messages via email. Maybe it's opening up a one-on-one help meet. That's something that I do with my in-class support teacher, where if we're in this large class setting, I will open up or she will open up another Google meet. And we make that available to our students if they don't feel comfortable asking questions in front of everybody, either audio or in the chat, they can pop over to another Google Meet where one or both of us are always in at the same time. Now, the one hookup with that, hookup, hiccup with that is if you're on your one district laptop, regardless of the screen, you're taking up a lot of screen space and it's going to be more difficult to manage. So that secondary Google Meet or displaying games and things, if you have a way to connect a second monitor to your laptop or your setup, I strongly recommend that. Um, I'm not saying run out and go buy a second monitor from Best Buy right now, because then you will have left a half hour early and I'll be upset. But maybe reach out to your building principal or somebody else and maybe see if you could ask if, could I borrow a monitor? Okay. Um, I am almost Batman here. I've got three monitors, but this is my own setup. So I've got three things that I can do and move stuff around. Um, So if you have a way to get another display, even if you hook your laptop up to your TV, you could do that. And then you could see your kids in 65 inches of glory. I don't know Um, if you have questions about that. (laughs) If you have questions about that, you know, let me know. Uh, All the district laptops have, I know the the Windows ones have HDMI out. Uh, If you have a Chromebook, you might be able to ask for an adapter. Um, I partly say good luck, but you might be able to get an adapter where you could connect it to um, a larger flat screen display. Okay. Um, Any questions, comments? I'm I'm getting the laughs, but I just want to make sure that you're also getting growth and value. (laughs) Excellent. All right. Um, Thinking differently about classroom management. Oh, classroom management. Remember that? Remember that? Remember that? (laughs) So, You can't really manage students when they're at home. You know their home. They know their home. (laughs) And yet, we're supposed to be at school. So behavior is different in this environment. How we address the behavior is different. What we choose to reinforce, what we reward, what we ignore is going to look a little different, especially across grade levels we do need to be careful about how we address those behaviors because it's literally in front of the entire classroom, right? I can't pull a kid out into the hallway to address a misstep. I can't sometimes speak as freely as I normally would because I don't know if mom or dad are listening or there's a little brother or sister running around that can also hear what I'm saying. So maybe it's emailing a student Maybe it's setting up that one-on-one Google meet. Maybe it's asking them to stay after or arranging time to, to speak with them. Um, And I'll be honest, I, there's a lot that I just have to let go because what's a write-up going to do with it? What's going to happen, right? You know, there's no detention Um, to the best of my knowledge. I don't know if anybody has been suspended since March, not really sure, but you know, how we can discipline kids looks a little different. Um, in my experience, I, I let kids know, here's when you need to be here. And they know that by X time in a block, if you come in after, I'm going to mark you late. And ultimately that impacts their attendance. Okay. Um, my students know that if they are non-responsive, that impacts participation. And, and we do checks, we do, you know, we'll do a mic check. Everybody, I mute your microphone, say, Hey, everybody in the chat, let me know you're alive and put your favorite number so I can go pick lottery numbers later. In fact, why don't we do that now? If everybody could put their favorite number in there that's lotto eligible, maybe we'll all get lucky. (laughs) So, but but how we how we manage and how we discipline obviously looks very different. 
Yeah, Anthony, that's my favorite number, 27. Oh, you can't see it in the back. It's up on the wall. That's my jersey number. One, two, three, four, five. By the way, I found the best password. I think I typed this right. I'm not sure. One, two, three, four. Oh, I, I messed it up. But you get the idea. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eights. So maybe make that your Wi-Fi password. And can you, conf- you can confuse people. That's a technology joke. Mr. Kyoto knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Oh, don't throw me into the bus now. (laughs) I just want to make sure you were there. (laughs) Um, Number 10. Obviously, we want to try to ensure the privacy of each of our students. And this is another one of those easier said than done remote teaching tips. Uh, But privacy, you know, there are things we need to be aware of. That's why in my classroom, I don't require cameras to be on. I don't, you know, I want to see something I'm not supposed to. um, And I, I... it takes the pressure off. Yes, I know that that makes me then feel bad where I will then complain. I haven't seen my, I don't know what some of my kids look like, only their SpongeBob avatar. Um, but it, it takes that pressure off and it makes them feel a bit more comfortable. Uh, and, and I know from having some of my students participate in Flipgrid activities that they are not learning in the best environments. They, they are learning where they are. And even through Flipgrid, I've seen some things that have made me be like, I feel bad that like, clearly you're not sitting at a desk in a nice place. And, you know, I know their environment is everything. So to try and protect that and give them a sense of comfort has certainly helped by not being like, okay, everybody turn on your cameras, let's go. You know, and, and I hear people in, in other places that, that do have to do that. Either the district says they have to, or teachers are making that choice. And, Again, I am just one person with one opinion, but I mean, I don't really need to see them. Number 11, we need to design things to be engaging. Okay. Now this isn't always doable, but when it's possible, we need to put in the extra effort to design lessons and activities within our lessons that don't just encourage engagement and student participation, but that work even if they don't participate and Again, I go back to anyone know what this is class. Anyone, anyone, anyone seen this before? We have all asked questions and it, you'd be happy if you actually heard crickets, right? So everything we do has to work even when they decide not to speak up or answer the question. And I know that can be super frustrating. I, I was frustrated today. I was frustrated yesterday. You know, I had students doing presentations on Monday gave certain groups feedback. The groups that didn't go on Monday went yesterday. And, you know, it's like they weren't there on Monday, even though they were, and the presentations didn't get any better. So that's one example of they might be there, but they're still not paying attention. So we even still have to repeat directions almost excessively. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm fortunate to have, again, an in-class support teacher who you know, if she's giving directions, I am translating into the chat and putting things that they can read if they're not exactly paying attention verbally or, and, and vice versa, where she will put stuff in the chat that I'm saying, and she'll summarize and, you know, make those, that information available. Number 12, test everything, plan ahead and assume everything is going to break. Don't assume. And, and again, we know our kids, their, their internet's up, their internet's down, their internet's up, their internet's down. And I started the year a bit skeptical. But then the more I learned and the more I I got to know my kids, it's the reality. They don't have great internet connections. Some of them do, some of them don't. And a lot of them, it's a daily struggle how they're connecting on their Chromebooks. So you also have to account for that. You know, I've got, you know, we've got great Nearpods planned or great Pear Decks planned. And then you get the kid who says, I'm on my phone and I'm with my parents because for whatever reason, I'm in the ninth grade and can't stay home alone, whatever. And I'm on my phone and I'm just listening. So how engaged can they be in the activity? So again, that goes back to the grace, the empathy, and what we allow and what are we going to get on their cases for? Um, Test everything. Again, even still, you know, there are things. I'm here on my home computer. I'm not restricted by any filters or anything like that, but I still have to be aware of the fact that the students are on district devices and things that I send them to might not work, even though it works for me. So that's also still in the back of my mind. In addition to the internet's up, the internet's down, the internet's up, et cetera. Uh, Number 13, empower students, emphasize autonomy and engagement. Uh, 
the easiest strategies here are student voice and student choice in what and how they learn and how they demonstrate their learning. This applies to lessons that you've done with students either together or here in the virtual environment. Designing activities that are maybe asynchronous, where the students have the opportunity to be self-directed, uh, that, that something like Genius Hour or 20% time where you can kind of let them go and explore, that could also be valuable. Um, for preschool students, uh, in, in talking with other people that I know, they use things like Marco Polo Learning, uh, and they pair that with something like Epic Books, and that can make for a powerful combination where the students are empowered that, that's a that's a word we like around here, empowering our students. So let's try and give them that opportunity to make sense of content at any level. Empower the kids. 14, think before, during, and after the learning. If we're empowering the kids and we're encouraging them to explore things on their own and they're more self-directed in certain situations, then we need to be doing certain things before, during, and after. This is going to help us think carefully about what the students are going to do what they're going to be able to do both before, during, and after online lessons. So that that's, you know, a simple planning strategy, which goes into when we're thinking about our objectives, uh, what should they come in with? What do we want to give them? And then what can they do after we do that? Using the right platform for the right teaching. This one's one of the easy ones. Um, Google drive. Yeah. You can share a video on it, but it's not the best experience. Um, Google Meets is not the best platform to hold, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations when you have everybody there. So we have to be aware of how we use the tools we have and using the tools the best way we can. Like when we go into the tool bag in the garage, find the right tool for the right job. This one puts a little pressure on us to, as best we can, to know the features and functions of our platforms inside and out. Me, I'm a huge fan of education technology, and it, it's no skin off my back to sit in the evening on the weekend and watch a video and see a tutorial or listen to a podcast about Nearpod or Pear Deck or really dive into these tools. I want to learn for myself, and that helps me then better use the tools with my kids. But then I go back to, I don't know. And sometimes the tools don't work, right? We, we can have all the answers, we can be prepared, and then something doesn't work. The, the free trial expired, or, you know, we find out we don't have access to this or that, or the kids can't click on it, okay? Or it just doesn't load on their machine, or it doesn't decide to load on our machine at any given time. But understanding the features and maximizing what some of these tools can do is definitely going to benefit you, and it's also going to benefit the kids. Connecting individually, again, I, I brought this up and I just want to highlight it again. How are you connecting with your kids one-on-one? -on -one? Okay, so is it that one-on-one -on -one Google Meet? Is it email? Is it Remind? Is it Class Dojo? Is it going into OnCourse and, you know, emailing a student from there? Or how are you communicating with the whole class? How, how can you draw them in? You know, maybe send the class an email over the weekend. Get them excited, you know, send them, you know, a riddle or a puzzle or something, an article to read that you found, or, you know, maybe if you're working with older students and you find something valuable on Netflix or YouTube, you know, share that out, you know, build that rapport. Again, one of the benefits of, of just teaching in the present day, regardless of pandemic and virtual learning is our classrooms don't need to have walls. And we're just really sort of fortunate that our classrooms literally have no walls at this point. So we do have the ability to share out and not bombard them with information and making them feel like, God, does this class ever end? It's, it's like 24 seven with this, with, with Miss Hyman. I don't She just never stops sending stuff out, <laughs> you know, but we can take advantage of that and we can get them curious. We can spark their interest. Uh, this next one, be selective and be intentional about what you do. Ours are interested. <laughs> What's up, Ms. Hyman? I said ours aren't very interested. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to work harder. Yes. Yes. That's why we're here. <laughs> That's why we're here. Um, but the definition of synchronous learning is that it's learning the same thing at the same time. And 
that's not going to work for everybody. You know, this kind of works for us, you know, because we're adults. Um, but even then I, I sit here thinking, God, I've been talking for a half hour. I want to shut up. So I'm trying to like move through this so we can actually share out some ideas. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe in doing that, maybe it's creating those breakout rooms, creating them ahead of time. Now, one thing that I'm unhappy about Google for is it doesn't save the, the breakout rooms that you create from day to day. But what I did learn is if I get into the Google meet before they do, I can set that up. So as kids are joining, I can be typing their names and be building the groups as they're joining, um, which has been helpful. That, that way I can say, all right, your groups are set up. I can launch those groups and then they can just click and they can go through the digital portal to those rooms. Um, but definitely creating them ahead of time. What we do in just a couple of minutes, I'm going to shuffle it and you're going to wind up randomly wherever you end up just to give you the opportunity to connect with some people and share some ideas. Um, but at this point in the year, maybe you can randomly assign your students to groups or you can randomize it and then you can go in and you can fine tune it before you open them up. I mean, I know that Miss Sheridan and Miss Moody, they don't really like each other. Um, so I'm going to try and make sure that when I break them out, that they're not going to be in the same group if I'm trying to randomize it. Again, this is where being a teacher is like being a magician. The audience just has to think they have free choice, but really we're pulling the strings behind the scenes. How are we leveraging the beginning and the end of our remote sessions? Icebreakers aren't just for the beginning of the school year or when you first meet your kids. Again, I live that every day with the literal random questions that I ask my kids every day to get them talking, which helps them virtually still get to know each other. Miss Sheridan, that is definitely something you would say. Are you, did you start that rumor? <laughs> ah, yeah, he would do something like that. That's shady McDermott. <laughs> um, so how are we using the time at the beginning and the end? Um, in, with, with people I've talked to around the country at this point, um, we have to even create those water cooler moments, you know, where there is downtime. In our regular full-time in the building classes, I'll be honest, we're not real. Nobody really teaches bell to bell down to the second. There's always a little bit of downtime at the beginning, a little downtime at the end. There are these lulls during a block or, or time. That, that's just the truth. So in this setting, we kind of have to create that. You have to foster that downtime, you know, where maybe there is the last 10 minutes to do something fun, play a game, high school, kindergarten, second grade, doesn't matter. You know, we all like a little downtime where we can just kind of breathe, Right. We just want to have a little time to relax. And sometimes that can happen during class. Obviously, checks for understanding are super fun. Uh, again, having kids type things in the chat, using the polling feature inside of a Google Meet. Um, I actually learned very quickly that when I ask a poll question, you know, maybe a yes or no, or even a multiple choice, while I might not know who says or how they answer that question in the moment, when I get that email after I close down the Google Hangout, uh, the Google meet, I get an email and then I can open up a spreadsheet that shows me who answered what. So if I do an exit ticket and I did this the other day, I said, you know, yes or no. Did you finish what we, what I asked you to do today? Yes or no. And they answered yes or no. I had all the kids respond. And then I was able to go back after class and see, all right, these are the actual 13 kids who were honest enough to say, I didn't finish. I could e I was then able to email them, not individually. I BCC would it and just said, I saw you didn't finish today. Just here's a friendly reminder. Make sure you finish that task before you get to class tomorrow. And that made a difference the next day because I had more, I still had a couple of kids who still weren't where they needed to be. That's par for the course. Um, but using the tools inside of a Google meet, certainly very helpful and being able to have, you could preload those poll questions. And then as you're going through a lecture or a lesson, you can just launch them and just say, all right, there, there's a question, go, go answer the question. So building in those quick checks for understanding. It doesn't have to take you five minutes. You could keep talking. They're, they can answer it and you can keep going. So definitely something to consider. Uh, be intentional with transitions. I'll be honest. I kind of suck at transitioning. All right. Going from one topic to the next. I, I try to make it work. I, I try to be funny about it, but it doesn't always work. Sometimes it's clunky, um, but it is always intentional. It, I, I don't randomly wind up doing something 
how I get there might not be the smoothest, but I know what I want a block of time to look like from the time it starts to the time it ends. Yes, you can use the use it uh, for attendance check-ins. Absolutely. Mike checks different things because I've got kids who I know they log in and they think just having their avatar in the Google meet that counts for attendance. It doesn't, at least not in my book. That, that's just, that's just what I do. <laughs> um, 24 using a timer again, because I can share my screen. I can go to Google and just type in, you know, 25 minute timer, go full screen. I share it. The kids can be working independently while we're all in a Google meet. My camera's on my in-class support teacher's camera is on and they can see, you know, when we're going to be reconvening. And that's also been really helpful. So using a timer and there's a lot of fun tools out there. You know, if you want to make them flashy or pull in a YouTube video timer. Um, but I found just the quickest thing is just go to Google and type in exactly what type of timer I want. Literally. I, I want a 45 second, 45 minute, 35 second timer hit enter. It's going to pull up on the Google search page, a 45 minute, 37 second timer, and it's going to start counting down. So thank you, Google. This is why I want to date Google. Consider how you group the kids digitally. Again, we go back to Miss Moody and Miss Sheridan hating each other. So you want to consider what strategies you're using when you're grouping students and how you're having them work together. Um, I actually had some students work together in a group project recently, and one student wasn't pulling their weight, and they got called out on it by one of their other group members. And that frustrated this particular student that another person wasn't pulling their weight to the point where they sent me the messages. And it was like, here, here, Miss Nessie, here, here's the evidence of this person not caring and telling me they don't care, blah, 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 blah. So I'm like, all right. I mean, again, they are there. I am here. There's not much I can really do other than have a conversation with the members of the group and do the best that I can. Um, but consider how we are grouping and organizing our students. And one bonus thing, teach for engagement. Consider everything I've shared and everything you're thinking about what I've shared. Uh, checks for understanding, calling home, you know, holding kids accountable, games, polls, back channel in the chat, everything. In this time of instability, and I'm trying to be nice about it, <laughs> um, there are unique social emotional needs that need to be met. And there's a lot of pressure on us that, that kind of goes without saying. Um, just teaching your content, I mean, content in some respects is almost secondary because we really need to, and it goes back to number one, we got to care about our kids. We got to show, show love, show care, show empathy, show grace. And that that's got to be the number one thing, caring about the kids. And sometimes content is going to have to take a backseat to getting them engaged, making them feel like they're a part of something. Um, imagine being a ninth grader in high school. It's tough enough to get involved in your high school when you're actually going to the school. Now you're in ninth grade and how do you get involved? I mean, it, it's challenging for clubs to run. It's challenging. I mean, after school activities, yeah, the athletes have their thing, but last time I checked, there's no third grade soccer team at McKinley, right? So how are we getting kids to feel like they are a part of a community? So get them engaged and it can't always be about the content. If you enjoyed this, I'm Chris Nessie. If you didn't, again, fill in another name. Um, we have a few minutes and I'd like to give you guys, I, I won't do the breakout thing because I was long-winded, but if you want to unmute, share a success story, ask a question, um, let, let's use our time to make sure we all get value and I want to give you guys a voice. Hi, um, my name is Jerley. I am a teacher at the middle school, um, Paul Wilson. And, um, I know that great crap rooms were, I guess, recently <laughs> introducing the Google, um, classroom setting. And I tr attempted to kind of do it, but it's intimidating to be honest. So I haven't really used it. The one time that I try to set it up, it didn't kind of work. So, um, are you by yourself? I am. That, that can be very intimidating because, you don't know what's going on. You can't see all the rooms when it, when it does work and you get your kids into those breakout rooms. Um, so there has to be 
a certain level of trust when you let them kind of go on their own. But it it's not that different from when we're in our classrooms and I'm over by my desk or I'm with one group of students. Yes, I, I know I can hear what's going on, but I don't hear and see everything while I'm working with three or four students at a time. Um, but hopefully you can build trust. And again, you, you started by saying it like it didn't work, but I would continue to try. And again, how you design the groups and uh, maybe just create time where they can kind of play in the group. So maybe you give them something fun to do just to, yes, they will learn how to use the tech. You get more comfortable putting them in the breakout rooms and, you know, I wouldn't put them in there at the beginning for assessment, you know, get them comfortable with it. And and you have to get comfortable with it too. Can I make a suggestion? Yes. I talk a lot. So (laughs) I'm Liz. I'm in the high school. (laughs) Um, I hear what you're saying about it being intimidating, especially when you, if you want to group the kids in certain groups and the first time you're doing it, you're like, you have to type it and you know, the, the kids can't come in yet. So you're like, Oh, so I, j- if you just want to start using breakout rooms, I would like Chris suggested, wait until the end of class and give a short, fun, social activity so what okay. i did say was i had in my avid classes and i'm also not teaching any core classes till february so i'm in a different boat but in my avid classes in the last 15 minutes i said you're going to have eight minutes in your breakout meet to find out three things you all have in common hmm. okay okay so i had i think f- i had enough r- enough room so that there were like no more than four kids in there and then i they were in their breakout rooms and I went into each one and I just reminded them of what they had to do. And I told them, you know, this, and I would, I made sure that I muted myself and put the video off so that I could sneak in the rooms without them seeing just to check on their progress. (laughs) And, um, cause otherwise I make crazy faces like this and disrupt, but it's, um, it's, it was something fun. It was low stakes academically, but I feel it's worth the investment to get them talking to each other. And this was the first time that any of the kids had unmuted for anything. And I told them, you could talk in the chat, but it'd be cool if you unmuted. But something like that, like at the end to close out. Mm -hmm. And then when there was about seven minutes left, I closed all the rooms and had them come back and had them report on what their commonalities were. So that's That's one suggestion. So then it's a 15 minute investment of time but I think it's especially, you know, we, we want to use these tools and everybody wants us to use the tools. And you know what? We're not going to use the tools the right time, the first or second or third time. We're, mm-hmm. we're going to break stuff, too. So that's my suggestion to you. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to try welcome. that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to do that tomorrow. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm, I'm going to go into my Google Meet and tell the kids we're going to play eight minutes in heaven. I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 I laugh. I'll probably say that they have no idea what that means. At least I don't think so, but you know, I can't be naive. Um, and else ideas, what's working. I, I know from seeing who signed up for this, that there is a, we are, we span the grade levels. So elementary school teachers, middle school, other high school peeps, what's going on? What's working? I was uh, frustrated with you. I'll share something. I think I'm unmuted. Am I muted? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We can hear you. That's like the biggest thing is when you give all these instructions and then you realize you're on mute. (laughs) Yes, that happened to me yesterday. (laughs) Um, So one thing I've been doing that uh, also helps kind of ease my transitions, um, usually about 35 to 40 minutes into class, I give the kids like a five minute break and I'll put on, I'll like share my screen. It'll be like a five minute chair yoga video or desk yoga video. And I've, anyone who doesn't know, I'm also, I run the yoga club. So it's kind of in my realm of things that I do. Um, but I always have kids who will put in the chat, like I have to go to the bathroom or I'm going to go make my breakfast. So I tell them like five minute break. So you can do this. You can go feed your dog. I know I have to, or go run to the bathroom, do this stretch. And then it just makes it a little easier to transition activities so it might be like directed instruction or something in the beginning or modeling something and then before I send them on their way to work in their groups or by themselves we take that break and a lot of them tell me they actually do the the yoga video which surprised me a little bit I've had a couple kids email me asking for the link to do it on their own um but 
you know, staring at a screen and sitting at a desk can't be good for, you know, growing kids. And they appreciate having a second to not be on. Mm-hmm. That's, That's my thing. Love it. I'm going to ask Allie, if you could email me some of the, some of these five minute you, um, yoga. yoga videos. Yeah. I have like two or three that I cycle through. It's hard to find ones where it's like not someone in like a sports bra or something. So I have like three that are, are solid. I'll send them. I'll put okay. them in the chat. Cool. Thank you. Yep. I, I, I even have kids like when I'm playing, like, cause like I pipe my Spotify into my Google meets. So I, I've had kids say, oh, you know, I really like this music. Can, can you send us the playlist link? And, you know, today they were doing something about the Great Migration. And I was playing music from the 1920s because you can get any type of music on Spotify. So I had some kids say, this is really relaxing. Can you say so I Now they can listen to music from the 20s on Spotify. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Um, we have five minutes left. So I'm going to take this time to thank you all for attending. Uh, I'm going to put in the link for the professional development survey. Thank you, Miss Moody, for sharing uh, those links. Um, again, I did record this. I recorded uh, the chat as well. So since I have everybody's email who signed up for this, I will send you the recording. Uh, I will send you the presentation. I will send you, we're friends now. So I'll, I'll just send you all sorts of stuff. Now we're all connected. I hope you enjoyed that session. I, I really enjoyed sharing it with you, as as I said, leading up to me sharing it. But if you have other strategies, send them to me, chrisnessy.com slash feedback. Get me your strategies. What's working for you? What hasn't worked? Okay. That's how we will grow together. It's one thing to always be sharing our successes and what's working, but some, sometimes by sharing what we stumbled with, what didn't work, you can help people too. Okay. Not everything that I said in there ha- has worked for me. I've tried a bunch of the strategies and there are things that I'm still going to try. I don't know what's going to work until I try it. So just like technology, these are things that we just kind of have to do. Teaching when we're in regular times is very much an experiment. And, and I kind of see it that way. There are things that I have done in the past that work really well, that I try them again and they flop and, you know, vice versa. But Again, let, let's come together, share your strategies, and uh, we can all grow together. And I really hope you enjoyed what I shared today. We got a little bit of feedback to do because uh, I asked for it, Derek asked for it, and we got some feedback. So on a recent episode of the podcast, we talked about, well, I didn't, but Derek talked about digital citizenship, and we got some feedback from Dan Gallagher. So Dan, let's, uh, let's hear what you got. You have new messages. Chris recently asked, how do you implement DigSit in your role in education? As a tech facilitator, I give recommendations of activities to do with students. Uh, Those activities could be hyperdocs, lessons that are posted on Nearpod, things I come across on Twitter, anything like that. I share those recommendations with my teachers, uh, as well as uh, ways to model or have discussions in the classroom with the students. So, for instance, when we're talking about um, creating a password, saving passwords, things like that, uh, that's why we implement in our district using a tool called ClassLink uh, to do single sign-on. So, talking with the students about utilizing that tool, going there to then be able to log into things like BrainPop. Um, So, just how to have those conversations with students so that it isn't just a when we celebrate Digital Citizenship Week or uh, Digital Citizenship Month, it's more of an ongoing, authentic, in real time conversation in the classroom. Absolutely, Dan. And that's the key takeaway for something like digital citizenship. It's not a, hey, it's the magical week or the magical day where we highlight it. Something like digital citizenship has to be integrated all the time. In my district, we use Clever, So that's a way that we can get kids very quickly and easily connected to a lot of the apps and software and tools. But again, in my own classroom, digital citizenship is important as I promote my students creating 
content. History is the vehicle, and then getting them to collaborate, communicate, and create, and critically think about that content. It's exciting. It's exciting to do that even in the virtual space. Yes, it is exciting. Breakout rooms, yeah, they can be kind of wonky sometimes. And yes, wonky is an official term, but it's working. Sometimes it doesn't work, but that doesn't mean I stop. It doesn't mean my kids stop. We learn, we adapt, we keep using the tools, and I try to instill in them and help them to see the right way to do things or the best way or give them the opportunity to make mistakes with the tools and they will learn and they will grow. You were a teenager once. I know I was, and I didn't always listen. So there you go. (laughs) Thank you, Dan, for the feedback. And if you have feedback on this episode, past episodes, you know what to do. chrisnessy.com slash feedback. Now, after quite a bit of time away, I am happy to announce a House of Ed Tech VIP. And that VIP, you heard her voice a little bit in what I shared today. And I want to shout out my colleague, Liz Sheridan. Liz is a proud Rutgers graduate who initially hoped to get into publishing, but then by the fates of the gods above, she considered a career in education. And I'm really glad she did. So are her students. She teaches English at my high school, and she's a phenomenal educator who is respected by her students and her colleagues. Liz loves literature, and she loves being around reading, and she figured that teaching would be a way to help other people access that love, whether they already liked reading or not. Liz is a former teacher of the year, but once you're a teacher of the year, you always rise to the occasion. She's also regularly nominated year after year in my school for that same honor. Most recently, though, and this is really, really cool. Liz received the 2020 Yale Educator Award, along with six other teachers and 24 counselors nationwide who were recognized as outstanding educators from around the world who have supported and inspired their students to achieve at high levels. She is kind of new to Twitter. She gets Twitter, but I want her to have lots of followers on Twitter. So go follow my friend and my colleague Liz Sheridan on Twitter. She is on Twitter at MS Sheridan NB, Miss Sheridan NB, MS S H E R I D A N N B. Liz, I'm happy to know you. I'm happy to teach alongside you, virtual as it may be. But congratulations, you are a House of Ed Tech VIP. Boy, this was this was fun. My hands are in the air. If I could be shooting confetti and celebrating, I would be doing that. I am so excited that I created this episode. I hope you are too. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you found value. You know what? I know you found value. So make sure you share the episode. Thank you again to all of my colleagues who chose to attend my session. And you took the time to share some kind words after the session in the feedback that I got. So that always puts gas in my tank. Let's keep the conversation going. I would love to connect with you. I say it every episode that I'm a part of and will always invite you to share your feedback. So if you've never done that, maybe talk to me about this episode. Go to chrisnessy.com slash 168, or you can send me a message by going to chrisnessy.com slash feedback. Now, if you enjoy the podcast, whether I am hosting or Derek's hosting, tell somebody else about the show. Word of mouth is the best way to share a podcast you love. And if it's not this one, share the love about the podcast you do love. But I hope it's this one. Also, I couldn't do the show without my awesome supporters. So thank you, thank you, thank you to the following people. Anthony Arnaud of the New Teacher Podcast. Dan Gallagher, you heard his voice earlier. Thank you so much, Dan. Carlos Garza, Mr. G. Peggy George, Jeff Herb, Mike Messner. J.P. Prezavento, and Lori Simpson, and Kyle Wilcox. Thank you to each and every one of you for your support. While I was away, the continued support was invaluable. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you want to get on board the awesome supporter train, choo-choo, <laughs> go to chrisnessy.com slash awesome. 
and you can find more information there. The next episode of the podcast, that is going to be episode number 169, and that is going to come your way on December 6th, 2020. Derek, again, will be back in the power chair one more time, solo hosting the show before he and I co-host episode 170, which again, that's going to be the 2020 House of EdTech Smackdown. Get your information to me by December 1st. And again, if you email me text, you take your chances with the impression that I will do of you. So record that audio, send me a phone message, whatever you got to do, get me the audio, and uh, we'll build that episode together. Until next time, you know what? I don't want this to end, but I'm going to keep talking because the music lets me. (laughs) All right, let's get out of here. Thanks for learning with me. And remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try. One more thing before I go. I'm doing a new thing here to connect with you. So I did a soft launch for this through the Facebook group, and I want to invite you who's listening to now become a part of the House of EdTech texting program, where you and I can text each other. I'm using Remind to power this, so if you want to get messages and send me messages and be a part of the community via text messaging, text at H-O-E-T pod to 810-810. You don't need the Remind app. You can use your regular text messaging app. That'll work fine. But if you want to get a part of this, text at the at sign, H-O-E-T pod, P-O-D, to 81010, or you can text it to 862-206-5925. And I'll see you in the text messages. Take care.